Sure. Oh yeah, shoot B1 behind on your seat. Is it? There it is, yeah. You just press the mute button until it turns green. Keep it pressed until it turns green. <laughs> Hello? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, well good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick this off. My name is Mia Pritchard. I am the Library Outreach Associate for the Leonard Fulton Public Library. And today we are here with Christopher Paul Curtis. <laughs> and so I'll go ahead and let him introduce himself. I'm Christopher Paul Curtis. Uh, this is, of course, tell me what this is. Michigan. Michigan. <laughs> and I'm from Flint. She's from Grand Rapids over here, which my Family is from Grand Rapids and moved to Flint in the 1950s, early 1950s. My father moved to Flint. Um, he was a uh, chiropodist, and his father, who's uh, Herman E. Calloway in Watson's or in Bud Not Buddy, uh, was a, a real hustler. He always had something going on. He was a yacht captain, he was a big band leader. Um, he painted trucks, he did everything. It was people which people did during the Depression. And he told my father after he graduated, he said, you, know, you should go to Flint because there's a lot of auto factories there, people have insurance. And he said, and you should find out what the highest uh, charge of chiropractic charges, and you should charge more. He said, because he said, you get a reputation by, you know, people think the more they pay, the more they're getting. Uh, my father was a businessman, you know, he, he didn't follow grandpa's advice and he you know, always blamed me for sending him into the auto factories because I was born in 53, that's his seniority year when he went into the factory. And hi everyone, my name is Dorothy Canton and I am a book of all things books and when I was asked to co-share this, I was very excited because I've read a lot of people call Curtis's novels and really enjoyed them. And I got a chance to reread one and read a few of the ones too, so that was fun. <laughs> Gotta be prepared. <laughs> okay, so we'll go ahead and get this started. Um, first, congratulations on winning the Milner Award. Um, looking back to all the previous winners. Thank you very much. Looking back to the previous winners starting back in 1983, it looks like you're the first winner to write primarily with social fiction. And I think that's a testament to your writing style to get um, young readers to vote for. Well, your mic is terrible. Yeah. Okay. I'll be right back and check it out. Here, keep mine. Here, we'll switch. Are you done? I guess I don't want you talking while I'm talking. Gotcha. Okay. Try this. Is this set? Okay, cool. So, and so looking back once again, you know, you're the first historical winner to win since it's been established in 1983. And I think that says a lot about your writing style to get actual kids to vote for an author who writes historical fiction. How do you write such engaging fiction, historical fiction, that gets young readers actually, you know, this is my favorite author? Um, I think it's the fact that I don't try to write historical fiction. I don't write about the events as much as I write about the uh, people who are involved in them. Uh, all my books, from Watson's Book of Birmingham, but not by Mighty Miss Malone, are, take place during historical eras, uh, civil rights movement, slavery, um, the Great Depression. But they're not about those things. And what I want to do is I want to write about how those things impacted young people. So what I do is I start out uh, with my characters being um, just, just regular kids, regular people, and as the story progresses, my dream and my goal is that uh, the reader becomes starts to identify with uh, the characters, and um, 
then I can tell a little bit about history. Like I can um, relate kind of the things that my parents told me. Like in the Mighty Miss Malone, uh, there's the importance of the Jones Mash Melon fight, uh, which you'll be reading about. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was a, a, a real moment in uh, black history because Mash Melon was this Nazi. Uh, well, he was Adolf Hitler's guy. He never was a Nazi, really, but he was Adolf Hitler's guy, and he was supposed to be the super white guy, the German, the Aryan master race. And uh, in the first fight, uh, he beat Joe Lewis, which just crushed the black community. But it was, it was like, I, I think the only thing my father said that you can kind of compare it to was like when Martin Luther King died, it was almost that bad for the way that it impacted the uh, black community. And in the second fight, where he, Joe actually didn't train very much for the first fight like this. And in the second fight, he came out and uh, within a few minutes, he broke the Schmeling's back. And he hit him so hard, he broke his back. And it was uh, um, something I find very interesting and I think young people should know about. Um, and I also I tell about, I think, later in the afterward, about how uh, Schmeling and Joe Lewis became very good friends afterwards. And Joe Lewis had income tax problems and uh, really was penniless after, you know, over there. So many people, if you're making money, find a way to steal it from him. He had agents and uh, lawyers who really took most of his money. And at the end, uh, towards the end of his life, it was Max Schnell, who was very successful with Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola, one of them. And actually gave Joe Lewis jobs and then took care of him for the rest of his life. So uh, I, I don't try to write historical fiction. I try to write a story about young people. But I love history, and I think if, it, if it's presented to young people in the proper way that they look into it. So when you're in the brainstorming stage of starting you know, a story, how do you decide what essence of that year is put into the actual book? Um, I kind of, the characters kind of decide for me. They, I start the story, and this is how I start anything that I'm writing. I'll start the story in my head uh, with a conversation, really. Just, I'm trying to get to know who this narrator is, and they'll talk to me and they'll tell me things. And it's just like any kind of relationship where you first meet somebody for a while, you don't get to know them, it's kind of awkward. But then after a while, I learn the person, as soon as I sit down and start talking to them right away, and I learn where the story's going, and I have ideas where the story's going, and I think that I'm probably the one who's controlling the whole thing, I don't know, but it feels like the characters do after a while, and they let you know if something's right and something is right. So uh, I have an idea, I think, okay, I'm going to write this, set this book in 1936, I'm going to set this one in 1858, and then um, I, I'll do research to find out what the time was like, uh, the way people, uh, what I'm doing research a lot of times, what I'm really looking for, is the way people speak. Because uh, we speak differently, uh, speech evolves. The way we speak right now is going to be different 20 years from now. And 20 years ago, people don't talk the way they do right now. Uh, and I know uh, with my kids, it's a constant battle with like. <laughs> Every other and then I was like, and you know what it was like, and like, and like, and like, I was tired to stop it because then you seem to become real self conscious. And then I went, uh, 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 and so um, I'm trying to find a speech and find speech patterns. Going way back, it's kind of difficult, but you can kind of try to imagine uh, because no one knows what Abraham Lincoln sounded like, what George Washington sounded like, what George Washington Carver We don't know what they sounded like, so you have to kind of. This is something I tell young people all the time. As an author, you're a very powerful person because you can create people, you can destroy people, you can create the way they speak. And if you can do it consistently and if it makes sense, then uh, you can get away with it and you can tell the story. That's a good segue. Um, your new song was The Journey to Little Charlie. Can you read a little excerpt and tell us a little bit about it? Sure. I'm a recent member of the Reading Glasses Club, so <laughs> this might be uh, um, this is a scene where uh, instead of uh, Charlie 
his uh, sharecropper. He, his father is Big Charlie. He's Little Charlie. Um, Charlie is called Little Charlie, but he's 12 years old. He's about 6'4", and weighs about 260 pounds. And his father was even bigger than him. And his father died in an accident where uh, he was chopping down a tree and he hit a stone that was in the tree that had been blown in there by a tornado many years before. And the axe head came back and creased him across the uh, skull and killed him. Charlie had to take him home. And the big fear now is that Charlie's mother probably can't run the farm. Uh, then uh, there's a man named Captain Buck who is the overseer of the nearby plantation. And he comes right after Charlie's father dies and says to Charlie's father owed him $50, which is an enormous amount of money back then. It'd be like $70,000, $80,000 for us right now. And you're gonna say, where are we gonna get this money? And so the captain said, well, I'm gonna go try to get somebody to go up north with me. I'm gonna go on a trip and I need uh, somebody to go with me. So I'm gonna come back tomorrow and you better have my money. And uh, so uh, he comes back, and Charlie and his mother, as soon as he leaves, they start loading the wagons. They're, they're going somewhere else. They don't want to be around when this guy comes back. And uh, uh, so um, uh, Charlie's mother is on the wagon, and Charlie's getting ready to load stuff. And they uh, look up. Charlie's mother's been, it's telling Charlie about some of the things that the father, that the, this Captain Buck has done, she doesn't want to be part of it. Um, and Charlie goes, and one of the last things he packs is the gun, uh, the, the family's gun. And that's it, uh, one of the things that uh, in American history, you know, we, we've got this gun culture. Now, oh, you know, I, I want my gun, I've always had my gun. And it's really not true because guns were very expensive. And not many people had guns. There, there were a lot of rifles. There were very few pistols, but there were rifles for hunting, and that was it. There wasn't. It wasn't as if everybody had a gun. Okay, so Charlie's mother says uh, she she takes the pistol. She's scared to death, and she tells Charlie, "If you um, if you see the captain, you got to shoot him. You got to promise me you're going to shoot him, no matter what." Uh, whatever happens, she says, we can't let him get a hold of us. Promise me you. And Charlie thinks, their time goes again, being a trickster and having things that was happening in regular pace slow down just enough so I was going to be forced to watch every terrible drawn out section. Second, I ain't sure if it was the way Ma's face twisted so she had the same look Grandma did the day she died, or if the highness of her shriek was made me draw, what made me draw and cringe. She fumbled in her lap and pulled with gripping the pistol with both hands. She couldn't even get it all the way out the curtain that George Washington's cousin had sold her. The first explosion had me ducking and covered my head. I looked over my shoulder to see what had scared Ma so bad. Sure enough, there, sitting astride his horse not ten yards from us, was Captain Buck, his eyes crinkling up in a horrible smile. Mine and his eyes both got pulled back to Ma and the pistol. It looked five times bigger in her hands than it did with Pop Holder. My first shot had blown a hole in a piece of curtain and one of the gold tassels had busted out of fire. The second shot belched out, out the barrel of a ball of sparkling flames that lit up the front of the wagon. It was a good thing Ma was creeping out with both hands. The recoil sent the gun jumping over her head. The third and fourth shot happened so quick, one after another, that Ma didn't have no chance to level the gun at the captain. Two bullets screamed off into the early morning sky. <laughs> Pat must not give Ma the same shoot lesson he gave me, or maybe he didn't, she forgot him. She was doing everything he said not to. She was taking raggedy, fast, fast breaths. Instead of thinking about where each shot was aiming, she was thinking about getting, she wasn't thinking about anything, but was getting as many of them bullets out that pistol quick as she could. The fish shot whizzed by me and thrown into a tree directly behind the captain. The six shot raised my pant leg, gentle as a kid rubbed against my chin. When Ma finally reached the curtain, rasped the curtain most of the way off the gun, it was too late. She was plumb out of bullets, and the click, click, click of the dry fire pistol echoed against the trees around the cabin. The terrible clicks sounded just as loud 
to me is a six round she fight. Shooting that pistol wore my right out. When she broke it down, she looked more beat than she would work in the fields from sun up to sundown on an hot July day. Me, Ma, and Captain Buck sat there frozen. I swear we held down the post for an hour. The captain first was to say was the first to say something. My, 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 he chuckled. If the way the Bobos traditionally say good morning to a visitor and by firing six shots at him, I'm letting one and all know. This is my last time of calling. And look, y'all never said nothing about uh, going off. Well, I'd, I'd have helped load the wagon if you'd have told me something. It's hard to know what to say to someone right after your mom took six shots at him from point blank range. After that, no amount of apologizing is going to get took to her. So I figured it'd be best to change the subject. I said, no, sir. Uh, that's kind of it, but we don't need no help. We did it over to Auntie May Mays just up the road for a week or two trying to get Mom better. She's been feeling puny lately, and the captain chuckled and said, you want to know why I'm so good at my job, big man? The last two words sounded as though he was cussing me. You ever heard of something called the sixth sense? I stared at him. Well, I've been blessed with what's known as the seventh sense. I get these inklings when someone's plot against me. The kind of itching comes to my skin when plans get laid. Do me and mine wrong. And I gotta tell you, boy, the minute I left you and your mom, my skin took to creeping and crawling like I pitched tent on a nest of fire ants. I tried fighting the feeling and says to myself, no, nah, Captain Buck, them boys is good folks, they ain't up to nothing. And I ain't got no problem understanding how to lose me a husband and pop so tragic like that y'all feeling a bit unsociable. But six shots to the face, maybe it's just me. But that dude seemed to go right past being unfriendly. That go all the way to being downright hostile. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we talked about gun culture and, you know, from the Washington to go to Birmingham, you mentioned the four girls were bombed in 16th Street Church. How do you broach these difficult topics, especially for young readers, in such a humorous way? Um, strange as it seems, humor and tragedy are very, very close friends. It's hard to tell when one begins and the other one lets off. And the age of the internet is kind of really uh, exaggerated this. Something tragic can have happened, and you can go on online two seconds after you hear about it. And they're jokes, and that's all pretty funny. But I think that humor is a way of dealing with tragedy a lot of times. Um, almost out of desperation, you, you, you're, you're searching for something to make sense out of it, and I think humor um, does that. It helps make sense of things. But I, when I'm talking about these things, too, young readers. And, and I, I have to be honest, I don't, when I'm writing, I'm not writing to young readers. Really. I'm, I'm writing to myself. I'm writing the things that I like to hear. But when I, I don't know, I know I'm writing to young readers. And then when I go through the editorial a part of my job, um, I, I get up in the morning and from, it used to be from five on, I would do editorial. As, as I'm getting older, I'm waking up earlier and earlier. I'm getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning now, and I start to do the editorial part where I take the story that I've written. Um, when, when I'm thinking about it, I write it, I just let it flow. I don't think about how it's going to fit into the story. I just let it go. And then I use the uh, time in the morning to uh, cut out stuff that is inappropriate or that is uh, it's not well written. I, I try to uh, do that at that time. Okay, um, segue into so what if you and your editor disagree on how the scene should work out? How does that play out? Like who like who gives the takes or so forth to make a change? The book says the journey little Charlie by Christopher Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you know, it says random house on the side. Um, or scholastic on the side. Uh, I, as the author, I have last say as to what go. But my relationship with my editor is a lot like their relationship with their English teacher. And if they're smart, they listen because the English teacher knows some things that you don't know. And I realize my editor is looking at the story in ways 
that you know I don't look at. Um, she's looking at it in the sense of marketing and uh, in the sense of it's a different set of eyes. So it's good to have somebody else looking at it while you're doing it. So um, if there is any kind of a problem, we'll go back and forth and back and forth. And she'll try to convince me, and I'll try to convince her. And in the end, you know, one of us wins the other doesn't. Um, and one of the things that uh, uh, in the book, Buck and the Sirens, which is really kind of a, a young adult book, it's about a boy in Flint whose mother is kind of Flint's biggest slumlord. And she's trying to uh, let him, work. she wants him to run the business once she retires. And he doesn't want to do it, he wants to be a philosopher. And uh, in there, there's a scene where the narrator and his friend. His friend is trying to find a way to get out of Flint. He's looking to sue somebody. He's got a lawyer called Dante Gaddy, and his motto is, or his phone number is 1 800 sue them all. <laughs> and uh, the uh, narrator gets a call from his friend and says, It's really windy outside. Come here by Taco Bell. And he says, Why am I going to buy Taco Bell? He says, The roof of the tile will lift it off the roof. And uh, I want you to hit me in the head with one of them, and then I can go into Taco Bell and, you know, and we can sue him. So the uh, boy, go, Luther, goes and he meets him and his friend bows his head down, you know, and Luther hits him. He says, you got to really hit me. And so he hits him again, and he says, no, he hit me. And he really cracks him. And, you know, his friend falls down and blood starts gushing out. And just as they're getting up the uh, the door at Taco Bell opens, and the manager says, I saw what you did, I'm calling the police. <laughs> and so they run home, and he bleeds all over the basement. And uh, his mother, uh, the Sarge, uh, the book's called Buck and the Sarge, and he calls his mother the Sarge because she's like a sergeant. She goes down in the basement and sees all the blood, and she comes up and tells him, I, I'm telling this because this is something my editor and I, this probably going to be far out of the longest. Uh, the mother, who's really tough, says to him, get down in that basement, better clean everything up. She said, it better look like OJ's been through there when you were done. And I remember the first time I read it, she was in the front row of her jaw, just went, <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you can't use that, you can't use that, you know you can't use that. And I said, no, I think I can. I said, I think it's, and she said, no, no, you know, Ten years from now, no one knows who OJ is. So little did she know OJ is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> and he's always got something going on. But I, uh, I finally, I, I, you know, one of the good things about writing, being a writer, is you know people that you can trust, that you can read, that can give you opinions. And there's a professor uh, named Paula Gracie at North Carolina State, and she, she read, she said, eh, you know, maybe not. I mean, so I, I took, I said, the mother said, it better look like Mr. Queen's been through that. And it doesn't have the same impact, but, you know, it's not offending anybody, so. So, uh, the short answer is, uh, I have the final say, but I respect her, and if she says something, I know there's a reason for it, so I'll look at it very hard. It's like you guys should, when your teacher tells you, you know, maybe you should do this differently. And, no, it's perfect. Then, you know, you got to go back and work on it again. Do you ever get feedback from young readers, like while you're doing a new project? I, not while I'm doing it. I, I have young people that I'll give it to after I have uh, written something. Um, it's, it's really difficult, I think, for uh, a young person to, to read a segment and to understand how it fits into the whole and uh, to understand uh, what it's going on. It's, they're a lot better at reading the whole thing and then you get kind of an overall thing. Uh, my seven-year-old daughter, I think, is going to be a reader. Um, she's, uh, uh, she, you know, she's one of those, she's one of those kids you were worried about because she wasn't reading. And it was like, she went to bed and I don't know if she bumped her head or <laughs> what happened, but in the next morning, you know, she's reading the Constitution. <laughs> and she just could she just read everything. She just is, is our, an excellent reader. And I think that uh, um, I might be reading a reader. So.
Do your kids like to read your novels? My kids are seven, six, and four. So they are not reading my novels. <laughs> um, my daughter, uh, seven year old, is Ayan. Uh, the six year old's name is Avion. And the four year old boy, our little surprise, is named Levi. And those are Somali names. My wife is Somali. Kenyan. And in Somali, in Somali culture, the name is very important. It's something that the child carries for the rest of their life, and so they put a lot into it. So I wanted to put a lot into it. So I talked to Somali elders and did a lot of research. And Ayan means, I get this confused sometimes, uh, daughter of the most intelligent, handsomest, kindest, most charming man in the car. <laughs> <laughs> And Avion means another daughter of the handsome, kindest, most charming, most intelligent man in the clan. And Levon, the little boy, his name is a prayer, and it's the prayer is, Oh God, let this be the last child of the handsomest <laughs> man. And um, when I was getting ready for this, research, 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 um, I visited your website, nobodybutcurtis.com. I think it's, uh, the name itself is a tribute to your paternal grandfather. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about him as well as his um, big grand? My grandfather, uh, both my grandfathers were remarkable people. They, uh, during the Great Depression, my mother's father, Lefty Lewis, uh, was a, I, I used to say he was a pitcher in the Negro Baseball League. Then I'd gone down to the uh, Negro Baseball League Museum in uh, Kansas City, and there was this guy there who, I think he was probably four or five hundred years old, and he asked me what the team was that my grandfather pitched for, and I told him, oh, he almost lost my That's not a Negro baseball team! <laughs> so, I, I don't say it anymore, but, but then my father's father, uh, just a fascinating man, he was a classically trained violinist, he played the saxophone, the uh, xylophone, uh, the accordion, uh, and his main instrument was the bass. And he also was, there are articles about him, there's an article from a uh, Cleveland paper uh, that says, uh, Negro captain of a yacht. And his, uh, uh, did you guys ever have A&P down here? The, the supermarket, yeah. Uh, the owners were Vander Jackson. My grandfather was a chauffeur for them, and they sent him to uh, a school to become a yacht captain. So he became a yacht captain. But he was—he um, died. At, he was 67 when he died. I, I never really knew him. I lived in Flint. He lived in Grand Rapids. Just the. Uh, um, but his band was Herman Curtis and the Dusty Devastators of the Depression. That was one of them. He would play any music. He played polka. He played country, anything he wanted, he would play it. Um, and he always had a white member of the band because uh, there were laws that black people couldn't own certain, couldn't own property in certain areas. And he wanted to buy the truck painting place and he put it in the white guy's name. Hmm. Uh, and uh, Grand Rapids is a, a, a Dutch area, there are a lot of people from the Netherlands there. And one of the, a lot of their names in an M.A. Ma, uh, Dyke Ma, Louise Ma. And so he's got a card that my grandfather had made where it's, uh, he's got his name as Herman Curtis Ma. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a hustler. He, he anything that uh, he was, he didn't smoke, he didn't drink. He demanded that uh, the people in his band Look, uh, didn't do it either. You know, they couldn't do it. They couldn't come drunk. Uh, they had to know how to read music. And it's interesting that there are things that you don't pick up because in uh, Bud Not Bud, there's a picture of the band. And I was in Winnipeg and there was a, a jazz bassist that was there. And he's, this guy's traveling. He's traveling with Marcellus, Elvin Jones, who's been around for a long time. And I showed him the picture of the band. And he said, he told me, he said, this is a very top-notch band here. He said, you can look at uh, uh, their clothes. So he, 
These little beef stuffs, and I never noticed it before, but they have matching tuxedos. They look very nice. And I, I remember my father always used to say that my grandfather uh, was a big fish in a little pond. So he was, he was a, a very uh, interesting man. He, um, I, but I didn't get a chance to know him very well. So in talking about your life experiences and his life experiences, did any of those moments lead into your stories? Uh, yeah, they do. Uh, a lot of the stories that, uh, uh, things that, I, I, this is what I tell young people all the time, writers have such an advantage over readers because we have so many tools that we can use to to manipulate you, to manipulate the reader and to make a story more interesting or to make you want to feel something for the characters. And so I, would, I take things that my parents have told me about their fathers. Uh, my mother's father, who was the alleged Negro baseball league pitcher, was a uh, red cat at the train station, which meant that he took the bags from people's cars and put them on the train where the Pullman Porter would take over. And he, he was the only African American in Grand Rapids during the Great Depression who bought a new car because he, was, he worked so hard and he got so many tips. And my mother said that as soon as he'd buy a new pair of pants, her mother would have to cut the pockets out and sew in heavy, a really heavy duty cloth because otherwise all the coins that he would, the nickels and pennies that he got would rip the pockets out. So he put things like that in. Um, it's just a million little things that you that you can put into uh, uh, from people's lives to make the story more interesting and to make it more realistic. Well, what's the most memorable question you've gotten from a young reader at like a school event or anywhere? <laughs> uh, let's see. There are the standard ones. What size shoe do you wear? <laughs> And I've noticed that uh, when you're having question time, it'll go fine, and then there'll be that one question, and then it goes straight to hell. <laughs> it's just right down the hill after that. It's usually the, what's your favorite color question, <laughs> or something along those lines. I'm trying to think, because, because you get some really serious, thoughtful questions uh, that, um, that it's amazing the level that kids are reading at. And, um, you know, I, I've, before I wrote The Mighty Miss Alone, um, it seemed like every school I'd go to was some girl would stand up and, and he would see she was a bookworm. I mean, it was written all over her face. She should have a scarlet bee on her forehead, her bookworm. And, it, and she, uh, they, they always say, um, why don't you ever do a book about a girl? And my answer was always, you're a girl, you do girl book. I'll do the books that I do. And then I thought about it, I thought, okay, well, let me give it a try. And I, I thought it was uh, dangerous because, you know, I, it, it's different. It's, it's tricky for a man to write about a woman, um, for a white person to write about a black person. And I, I think a lot of it has to do with the power dynamic. Uh, it's, I think uh, it's easier for a black author to write about a white person than it is for a white person right or a black author because we're paying more attention. And the same with male, female. You know, women are paying more attention to the men than the men are to the women. So I, you know, I debated it for a while, and I thought, okay, what I'm gonna try to do, I'm gonna just sit down and tell this story. You know, I've got daughters, I've grown up with sisters, I know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go for that. And I'm fortunate enough to have editors. And 99% of the editors for uh, literature for young people, and I'm not sure if it's an adult, but 99% are women. So you can give it to women, you know women. I've got one sister who's a, a good reader uh, that I can give to. Um, and you, you learn what, uh, um, you draw on those resources. And this is really not involved with, but as an example, I mean, you learn what people you can trust and what you can trust them with. And I've got, there's a, I've got a sister who's 11 months younger than I am, and she was in this category over here of 
you know, you let her read the book, and she says, oh, I like it, or I don't like it, I don't know, okay, that's enough. Uh, but then she had read this, and she said something to me, and I'm really grateful she picked up on something, and I'm really grateful that she did. Because <clears throat> in the book, Charlie, the slave, uh, uh, this guy was a slave catcher, the sharecropping white boy, who's been raised in racism, and, you know, like people are animals, really, goes to Canada to try to kidnap uh, a slave, or a, a boy whose family escaped from slavery. And he sees the boy with a, uh, at a school, he's wearing a uniform, and there's a, a young African-Canadian girl that he's there with. And, um, and when I had Charlie describe her, he said uh, she was kind of pretty, kind of love for a colored girl. And then uh, my sister called, I gave it to my sister, and she called and she said, oh no, you can't do that, you can't say that. And I said, what do you mean? I mean, this, this is how people think. She said, no, no. And she said, when I think of uh, little black girls in school having to read that and to be exposed to that and exposed to what that would draw to them from people making smart remarks about the statement, she said, I don't want that in there. And I thought about it, she's right. You know, that was something that I had to uh, cut out. I changed. He just said that she was a, a very pretty girl. Um, okay, so as a writer myself, I want to know, has your writing process changed since when you started writing and now? Well, you know, the hope is that you get better as you go. <laughs> You, you practice and you become uh, better at your craft. <clears throat> um, I think a big thing with writing is confidence. If you have confidence in what you're writing and you, um, as you notice, that, that's one of the hardest things to do, especially when you, you know, you're writing your first book or looking to have something published, it's hard to be confident. And even though I've written nine books, I still, when I write it, um, I'll read through a part and I think, wow, this is really good. And then I'll read it again, you know, a couple of days later and think, oh, shit. <laughs> My career is over. But uh, after a while, after doing it for a while, it, it's, writing is so much like anything else. One of the things I tell young people, it's like learning a language, it's like uh, playing a sport. Um, it's like you could learn a musical instrument. The more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. And a lot of it has to do with confidence and knowing that uh, this is what you want to say and this is what you want to say. And leave it alone, you know. Trust yourself. Just trust yourself. You have to learn to trust yourself because otherwise you'll go back over the uh, book again and again. And the story never really has to end because and that's what. People say, young people will say to me, you leave us hanging at the end. Why didn't you end it? And, and I tell them, life doesn't end. The story goes on. You know, uh, the characters, something else happens to them next year and the year after. So uh, you, what you want to do is you want to get to a place where they say that if, to finish a book, what you do is write the whole book and cut the last two chapters off. Because you, you know, you're, you're just doing too much at the end, towards the end of the book. So it's just a matter of developing confidence um, over time. And when I started, I wrote by hand on legal pads. I didn't have a computer. Because um, when I started, laptops were about this big and weighed eight pounds. And, uh, but then once I, I was late with the third book, and so I, I had to let our friend's computer and wrote it uh, on the computer. And for the longest time, I kind of thought the writing was different, uh, doing it by hand and by the uh, computer, because you write so much quicker on the computer. And, you, and when you're writing by hand, you slow down, and you can, uh, the ideas have a chance to develop more, I think. Uh, but, but also, I, I liked the uh, fact, because then you can tell where, what you were thinking during the writing. And on the computer, I'm sure somebody knows a way to do it, but uh, I don't with the word processor. You don't know what you've written before. And, um, a lot of the, uh, the forensic evidence, a 
of where the story came from was lost. So when you're somewhere and an idea comes to you, do you write it on a, like a notepad, your phone, or jot it down a napkin? What do you do? You write it on anything you can find. <laughs> napkin, anything, whatever. Because and that's one thing I think you, that you learn as you uh, become more experienced as a writer. If you don't write it down, you're going to create it. I don't know how many times I've oh, this is great, this is a great idea. I write it down in 15 minutes. <laughs> it's gone. And then you sit there and you think, what was it? And you, you can't bring it back. So uh, I, I try to write it down. And I probably, when I write it down, write the kernel of it down, then it's easy to go back and water it and give it some fertilizer and let it grow. Sure. And let's see. Oh, have you considered writing a contemporary novel about the water crisis in Flint, Michigan? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, um, that was supposed to be my, not the book I wanted, not the book after that. But uh, after doing research on it, I can't do it. It's too depressing. It's too horrible. Because I, I don't want to write something that is horrible. Even though there's things in life that are horrible. I don't want to write that. I don't want to. I think people have come to expect kind of a hope uh, from my folks. And, you know, it's, they're realistic, but there's hope because there is hope in life. And there's hope in Flint, too. But it's, it's I think the thing that finally made me um, really give up on the idea was when I was doing research, and there was a woman who had twin uh, children, had twin boys, and uh, identical twins. And after uh, a year and a half, one of them had stopped growing, and the other two was a head taller. And these are identical twins. And the, the lead affects the different kids differently. And it affected this boy so that he didn't grow. And it, you know, you, you stop and think about um, the horror of that, the terror of that, of growing up not wondering as a parent. Wondering what is you know what's going to happen with my child? I just couldn't do it, so I, I chose something much cheerier, uh, urban renewal, where they tore black neighborhoods down <laughs> to put expressways in, which you know is pretty bad, but but it's not as bad as poison uh, children. We've gone to Flint for something, and you forget you know you forget how all encompassing water is, and how important it is, and we were in the theater and. Uh, my seven-year-old skipped over to the uh, water fountain and turned it on. And as soon as she turned it on, it was, it was like she, you know, a bomb or something. Because people said, no! <laughs> and, and I thought, well, why don't they turn the water off? Because, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who, knows? who knows? You know, I think there are laws that you have to have a certain amount of work in water fountains in a place. But no, I, I can't. I can't do it. Someday, who knows? But it's uh, it, it's too close. It's too it's too horrible a situation. Flint has I, I Flint is like the Haiti of the United States. You know, it seems like everything bad happens to Haiti. You know, the hurricanes, cholera, you name it. Haiti catches everything. And it seems like Flint is um, in the in the same boat. Flint went from Population of almost 200,000 down to 70,000 now. At one time, there were 80,000 uh, General Motors jobs in Flint. There are 4,000 now. Um, for decades, Flint had the highest per capita income for African American people in the country and probably in the world because of the auto factories. And once that's gone, you know, Flint is just, Flint was kind of an artificial construct, anyways. Just a, a place where a guy started a buggy company, and it just grew from there. And um, it's you know, it, it's it's very sad. I can't deal with it. Okay, so now that you just kind of want to open the conversation up, so does anyone have questions? Yes. Do you have a pet? 
Did I have a pet? No, that's, um, uh, why did you say that? <laughs> um, my four-year-old son is obsessed, has been obsessed with vacuum cleaners. That was his thing, vacuum cleaners, from the time he was two. And knowledgeable about that. If you let him have the computer to watch things, what does he watch? Videos on vacuum cleaners. <laughs> and he can tell you, that's a Sharp, that's a Dyson DX4, this one has a retractable cord, this one doesn't, that's a crevice tool, that's an upholstery tool. And then he kind of got off it. He, he's got onto uh, puppies and dogs. And he wanted, he wants a dog. I want a dog, man, I want a dog. And I always grew up with dogs. I always had two dogs. I'd always have two dogs. And then um, mo both my dogs died within a year of each other when I was in my early 30s. And I didn't have dogs for a couple of years. And then a friend brought his dog over to his house, like, over to the house, and I, said, I was so allergic to this dog. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I said, you, you can't have a dog, be my mom. I'm allergic. You know, I'm not going to take allergy pills and shots so I can have some little animal shit and all over the place. <laughs> but I love dogs. I love cats. But I'm, I, I'm scheduled to go take an allergy test to make sure I'm allergic to dogs. Because he, he finally got to me when, um, a while back, but the girls had their uh, Halloween costumes, their uniforms. They're into this, they're into uniforms. And they had their uniform costumes. And we were driving somewhere, and I looked in the rear view mirror, and Levon was sitting there, and I said to him, Levon, what do you want to be for Halloween? And he started crying, and he said, Daddy, I said, what's wrong, Levon, what do you want to be? He said, I want to be a pet owner. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay. I mean, he's obviously not going to quit, so I'll, uh, I'm, I, because I like dogs, you know, I do like dogs. I think a lot of fun, um, and my, you know, I was always, my wife would blame it on me, uh, the fact that uh, we can't have a dog, and uh, she's Muslim, and her dogs are considered Haram, so I blame it on her, and now she said she's all right with the dog, so we we'll try to see if we take it off. I could I probably hear you. Good question. Why do my books stand the test of time? And um, it's strange, but they really do. My lawyer uh, used to be Stephen King's lawyer. Mm -hmm. And he said none of Stephen King's books have sold um, progressively. They, they sell a big boom at the beginning, and then they die. And um, one of the reasons is they're on the uh, core curriculum. And so they're in the schools, and that, that makes a big difference. Um, I, another thing is, uh, I think that it's the fact that, as I was saying earlier, I, they might be about historical things, but they're actually stories about young people, and that the reader becomes uh, involved with the young person and go for that. And another reason is uh, something that I'm sure you went through, and the same thing I've gone through uh, growing up, there were no books for, by, or about African Americans. They just weren't books. They just, you know, we'd, uh, we'd find uh, um, Sounder, Sounder was about it, but that was in the, what was Sounder in the 70s, wasn't it? You know, I was a, an adult in the 70s. So, but yeah, we, we find little black characters that were uh, Indian or whatever, anybody who had a dark skin, we kind of identified with that. But there was never us in the book. And I think that I looked up and fell into uh, a real void that, uh, because my books are, um, it, it, it really makes me feel good because to know that uh, young people have a chance to read something that I didn't have when I was a person. And there, there are more and more African-American male and female writers out there who are uh, becoming popular. I think the publishers are uh, finally starting to catch on. I know when I uh, sent the 
lots of been uh, to, I said two contests, one was uh, Boston, Massachusetts, Little Brown, the other was uh, Random House in New York. And I sent it to uh, the Little Brown and got a letter back, and it was a personalized letter. And when you're a writer, a personalized letter is supposed to be, right always like, oh, no, it's a rejection letter, but it's personalized. It's not like, nice try, you know, see you later, don't bother us anymore. And, and the woman, I, I wish I'd gotten a nice try, see you later, because she uh, read the book, and then she said, and I, I thought this is really odd, she said, uh, the characters are very realistic, the story is funny, um, one other thing, and she got poetic on me, she said, alas, I feel when the last page is turned, the book will not resonate with the readers. And so, um, and I'm not the kind of person, you know, you read about people who will have a book rejected 30, 40 times. You tell me twice, I get the message. And if uh, Random House, Wendy Lamb books, had taken the books, I, I would have, uh, I'd have given up on it. So uh, I, I think that's one of the reasons that they do. But it's, uh, it, it is, it's just, it's very surprising, very amazing, because they sell the two of them, Watson's and Bud, sell close to half a million a year. So, I'm not the boy. <laughs> yes? How old were you when you wrote your first book? How old was I when I wrote my first book? That was 23 years ago, so I would have been 14. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I was 42. 42. Yeah, there's hope. And that's what I tell young people. I tell young people, writing is the one art that there are no prodigies. You cannot, and we got librarians in here, and they cannot give me a really great book that's written by a really young person. You have to live, you have to go through a lot of different kinds of things uh, to be a writer. But it's really important that you do it while you're young, that you uh, learn how to move things around when you're young and write when you're young. And know that even though it's not going to work out now, it, it's, it's part of a, a stepping stone. And if you keep going down another path, you become a very good writer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes? So what was your inspiration outside of history? What is my inspiration outside of history? Um, I, I love to write. I, I have a lot of fun when I write. Uh, when I when I was writing the Watson's Go to Birmingham, I, I wrote it in the Windsor Public Library, and I, I would try different places to write in the library. And you know, I'm not a, a new age person. I don't feel like there's a vibe coming out of a certain place. But I was really comfortable in the children's section. I would sit in the children's section and I would write. And um, when I'm writing, I, I really get into it. And I'll laugh out you right now. <laughs> and, and you know, if it's something that's uh, sad, I'll cry. You know, and I'm sitting there, oh, please go and I'm crying. You know, and people know me crying. And uh, the, the library was about two blocks away from a hospital in Windsor. And the sixth floor was the psych unit. And I didn't realize this until after I gave one of the libraries my manuscript. They thought I was from the psych unit. <laughs> because, because I, and then I stopped and thought about it. There was a guy when I was writing, you know, I was, they called me the laughing guy. And they called him the numbers guy. Because he sat there for four hours writing numbers. He'd write four, seven, three, two, and he turned the page, nine, eight, seven, three. So he was from the psych unit. And they, they just saw me walk down together and, <laughs> and wrote. Um, yes. So, for the mind Miss Malone, mm -hmm. I did feel a bit. You felt a bit? I did. Okay, tell me where. At the end. <laughs> oh. We don't know what happened to the dad, and we don't know what happened to the son who's establishing himself. Um, let me explain, in the Mighty Miss Malone, uh, and this is where we were talking earlier about uh, bringing in real things. The, I was, uh, I mean, I'm sure all of you have done this, 
Uh, I was listening to, there's a show in Detroit called It Loves Jazz Hour. And Ed Love's got this jazz voice, and, and he plays this great music. And I was going somewhere to eat, and I was mad because Ed Love was playing this song. It was a long song, and it was just a beautiful voice. This, and I'm waiting for Ed Love to come out and say who it is. And I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. And then he plays like four songs in a block, and he, he gave the name of the people in the block. And I said, he didn't get the, uh, the woman's name who was singing this song. So I called Ed Love up. This was before cell phones. I went in and I went to the pay phone and I called Ed, Ed Love up in Detroit and I, yes, may I help you? <laughs> and I said, Ed, who, you didn't tell the name of the person who uh, sang uh, I'm Yours. And he said, oh, I did. He said, that's Jimmy Scott. And I said, oh, her name is Jimmy Scott. He said, no, that's Jimmy Scott is a man. And Jimmy, oh, I can't think of the name of one of his own. He had a syndrome where he stopped growing after age, after he was 12. And so he was a, he was a 70 year old man in the body of a 12 year old boy. And his vocal cords had never developed, but he had a beautiful voice. And that's why I developed uh, uh, Jimmy uh, in the story. He was developed after Kalman syndrome, it's called the Kalman syndrome. Uh, it's it's uh, developed after him. And he had a horrible life because, uh, you know, being a little tiny guy, he was picked on and he uh, was violent. But listen to him say it. He's got the most beautiful voice and it sounds like a woman you never know as a man. So um, I, I think, and you know what? Uh, I forgot about this. Go to my website. Uh, this, this, this is perfect. I forgot all about this. Uh, while I was writing the book, it was so bleak that I thought, you know, I can't. I, I gotta have something. Uh, give Deza Malone, who's mighty Miss Malone, give her something positive. So I wrote, uh, at the end, I wrote uh, a chapter about, uh, that takes place 40, 50 years later, where Deza is an adult. And she's a professor at a university, and uh, I, I forgot all about this. And uh, she meets these women in line, and uh, then at the end she calls her, she calls her brother Jimmy, who's ninety some years old and been married eight times. And he asked, Jimmy always asks her how her kids are, and gives all the kids names, and she always asks how his ex wives are, and three of them did. She always steals the house. Uh, this one, how's that one? Oh, she built the house, that one, that Because they always end up divorcing them, uh, but they always remain friends. And so you find out about Jimmy, too. So Jimmy did okay. Yeah, I forgot about that. Thank you for reminding me. And it's, uh, the website is Nobody But Curtis. And that's a, a tribute to my grandfather, who um, had a radio show with Grand Rapids. And he would start it with the NBC, the bing, 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 uh, every time. And uh, NBC found out about it <laughs> and threatened to sue him if he didn't stop, and so he stopped. So he, uh, yeah, nobody but Curtis. Okay. And then what happened to you, I'm going to tell you the same thing I tell you kids if they ask me. Just because I'm the writer doesn't mean I have all the answers. That's one of the great things about reading. Uh, you read, we, you and I can read the same book, and you get so many different things out of it than I will, because your experiences are different, and you're looking at it through a different lens than what I look at it through. So, and I tell the young people, what, what do you think happened? What do you think happened? Well, I think, I think he forgave himself for what happened on the lake when mm -hmm. he was fishing, and. I think, I think maybe he finally got a job because that seemed to be the driving force mm -hmm. for some of his decisions. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe not. Maybe he had to get resolved about his wife supporting the family. Perfect. And, and no, I'm serious, that's perfect. You thought about it much more clearly than I have. 
But that is, uh, and, and, and your uh, analysis of what happens is just as legitimate as mine. Uh, just because I wrote it doesn't mean I have the answers. That's what I love about writing. You, and that's why a movie is never as good as a book, because you put so much of yourself into the movie. You decide the way people talk, you decide the way people look, and uh, you own the movie, and, or you own the book, you own the character. So, but when you watch a movie, uh, you're getting someone else's idea of all that. So, so I think you're right, that probably did happen. <laughs> yes? Are you working on your next book? I'm working on the Urban Renewal book right now. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's about a lot of things that happened to me. And so it's kind of close to home, and I'm lollygagging more than I normally do. But uh, by the end of the year, I'll have that done. Yes? Uh, yeah, I've often heard that writers have, like, or it's not all writers, I guess, quirky rituals. Is there a ritual that you have to either like get to work or maybe get out of the zone or anything like that? Uh, no, you know, all I do is I. Uh, the only thing that's over at 3 o'clock in the morning in Windsor is Tim Hortons, which is a donut shop. So I go in there, they, as soon as I come in, they get my extra large black, no sugar coffee ready. I, the first thing I do is I'll, like, I'll read the newspapers on the computer, and I'm drinking the coffee, and then after a while, I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> and I start writing, so I think my ritual is the caffeine. It, it really does fire me up and then I write for three or four hours that I have to take the kids to school and, um, and that gives me a nice little break. And then some of the time I come back and some of the time I don't. Mm. But I don't have any, I, well, you know, I say that I, uh, kind of a superstition that I have, uh, since my first two books were written by hand, when I'm starting chapters, I'll, I'll, I'll carry a book and I, I will write uh, the first part of the uh, chapter. And then I'll get a page or two and I'll fly it right into the book, into the computer. Hmm. So that's my favorite. Yes? With Birmingham, the kind of movie, how did you feel about that? About getting a movie out of uh, Well, you know, it's. They always mess the movies, the book up when they do a movie, generally. Uh, and it's funny, the one, the one movie that I think was just as good as the book, which was an excellent book. Uh, was To Kill a Mockingbird. I think they, that was kind of like, wow, they really got it in, in that. Uh, and uh, Lois Lowry, who's a, a writer of young people, for young people, has said that the important thing is, when they're turning a book into a movie, is that they get the spirit of it. And that's the best you think you can hope for. And uh, um, when I come down to Atlanta, they made it in Atlanta, and Kenny Leon was the uh, director, and he, you know, he's going on to directing Denzel in um, oh, I can't, why don't he, A Race in the Sun. He won a, a Tony for that. He uh, directed a live, was it The Wizard of Oz? What was it? Yeah, it was. It was The Wiz. The Wiz, yeah. Um, and I, when I first met him, he leaned over and whispered in my ear, and I'm cleaning this up. He, he said to me, don't worry, I'm not going to let him mess your book up, man. And he, he stuck to his work. So, uh, yeah, you have to think of it as a completely different thing. Yes? I know you said that you were, were you born in Flint, Michigan? Born in Flint, Michigan. So, but where do you reside now? I live in Windsor, Michigan. Oh, okay. Detroit. Okay. Windsor, okay. right down here. Yeah. You have to, you know, a little quirk of uh, geography, you have to, to get to Detroit, I have to leave Canada and go north because Windsor is under Detroit. Yes? Do you ever have a time to just write and just imagine what's happening or even if it doesn't make sense, just write it out? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Writing is writing. Uh, some of the time, I don't know if you do this, but a lot of the time you just write stuff and, you know, I learned to let it go where it wants to go. I don't try to control it. I don't try to say, okay, this is going to be part of the story. This is not. There's some reason your head wants you to write that. So I just let it go. And some of the time it works out. Some of the time it's gibberish. But, <laughs> but you, you just do it, I think. I think you just got to let it go. 
So she writes to you like every day. Not so much with the goal in mind. Mm -hmm. It's the, the, mm -hmm. the practice. It's, it's Cover your ears. No. <laughs> <laughs> I try to write every day. I really do. And, and the reason I do that is writing is like a physical activity. Uh, because you get in shape for it and you fall out of shape. And if I'm working on something um, and I leave it for a, a couple weeks or a month, I'm in a big hole because I have to go back and get back to the point in my head where I was when I stopped writing. And it takes all time, you know, it, it is it's like a, a physical activity. It's a, it's a memory, muscle memory, it's like that. And so you have to go back and do it again. And it's just not worth it to keep starting and starting and trying to get back to it. I don't know if that's a great one. <laughs> um, so how do you know when a book is done? That's one of my problems where I can write and write and write and write, yeah. but I don't know the end. And it just keeps going. <laughs> and I have like thousands of words. I think you have to be dissatisfied with where it ends. I think that that is a, a good sign. You have to stop. You just have to stop. I mean, and it's only only you can stop it because I know the story never ends. The story never ends. Uh, but you have to just cut it somewhere. And then you have people who say, you know, you, you, you left the thing in there. What's going on? <laughs> but that's what you got to do. That's because uh, that's, that's life. That's the way things go. So I, I feel like some of the time if, if I'm dissatisfied with my last part of the book, I'll start backtracking, and then I'll find a place where I can say, cut, cut the rest off. Mm -hmm. well, so any questions? Yeah, we're going to wrap up. Is there any more questions? No? Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm off to visit and go see the lunch games now. <laughs>